Well, good afternoon. It's noon, so I'm going to we'll get started. I want to welcome all of you to our Agriculture Challenges webinar series that unfortunately we are needing to host. Um, today we are going to talk about cow-calf management. A lot of what we're seeing, the focus is then on crops and some of the, and the issues facing our farmers, but we also need to remember the challenges that our cow-calf producers are facing across the state um, from difficulties putting up hay, short, potential shortages of forage, and um, with cows being out in wet pastures and, they're, and folks are already starting to feed hay because of difficulty ac accessing their pasture and what they normally would graze in the fall to where do we put these cows and calves when we bring them back with, with the muddy lot conditions. Before we get started, I want to have a few housekeeping items. If you are not speaking, please mute your line so we don't get feedback. Um, we will answer all questions at the end. So if you have any questions, please hold them to until the end. If you're worried you're going to forget your question, type it in the chat box and we'll make sure it gets addressed. Um, and you can either ask your questions live or through the chat box, whatever, whichever you prefer. So we will get started. Our first speaker is going to be Jana Block, the Livestock System Specialist at the Hedinger Research Extension Center. And Jana is going to be talking about strategies for feeding cows. You see my slides okay? All righty. Okay, so let's set the stage a little bit here. There are a lot of challenges being faced by producers across the state, and obviously we have a lot of really variable situations. Um, down in my area in southwestern North Dakota, um, we definitely got a lot of precipitation this summer, um, but we don't have a lot of standing water. Um, unlike areas in the central and eastern part of the state. So we're trying to kind of cover um, a lot of potential variables, but definitely there's going to be um, specific situations that we're going to have to try to deal with as they come. So um, like Miranda mentioned, some cows are, are kind of maybe stranded out in um, summer pastures still, um, standing water, or muddy, um, can't get them out of there, um, potentially forage shortages, uh, maybe the calves aren't weaned yet. Um, we've got lots of unharvested crops. It's kind of challenging sometimes. You check with the feed stores and different suppliers. Uh, they're really uncertain about what the crop is going to end up um, and where it's going to end up. And so um, it can be challenging to get an estimate of what's going to be available and what prices we're going to be dealing with. A lot of hay is um, still sitting out in fields and people can't get it hauled because it's too muddy. Also, we have a lot of hay that's sitting in water, which obviously is undesirable. And then the Climate Prediction Center is saying there's a 33 to 50% chance that we're going to have a wetter than average winter. And so um, bracing ourselves for what could potentially be coming. Um, and then the cherry on the top, of course, is all the financial challenges that have been faced by producers, um, both crop and livestock producers, net farm income challenges, um, credit is tightening. Um, and so Obviously, you can't just buy more feed, and so you have to be really strategic and work with what you've got um, and try to really cut into your bottom line to, you know, maintain nutrient requirements, but without breaking the bank. So where to start? I think it's really important to assess and document, document, document. Um, if fences went out, if you've got damaged hay, um, talk to your people at FSA, talk to NRCS, um, programs like the Emergency Livestock Assistance Program can cover um, things like damaged hay and fences. And so those county offices need to hear from you guys and get an estimate of the damage that's actually, you know, going on out in the state. Do an inventory of your hay and other feeds. You know, what are you going to have on hand and what, where might you have to supplement? Um, we will talk through that a little bit more next week as far as getting specific about hay inventories and matching that up with nutrient requirements. Um, with all the potential damage, 
mold, mycotoxins, damaged grains, it's going to be really important to evaluate those and send those in um, for analysis to the diagnostic lab. And then this year, if you've never sampled and analyzed your forages for nutrient quality before, I would urge you to um, do that this year. We're going to have a lot of variation in forage quality just based on um, the stage of maturity that harvested where forages were harvested, um, different environmental conditions. And so the only way that we can really get specific and help you allocate your forages in the best manner is by knowing what the nutrient quality is. Um, Dr. Montanholi will talk a little bit more about evaluating body condition, but I will just say it's important to take a look at that now. It's a really good time of year at weaning to evaluate where those cows are at, and then if they're a little on the thin side, um, start working on that winter feeding program and getting them bumped up. So luckily for us here in North Dakota, we have a ton of feed options. We've got a lot of alternatives, um, a lot of different things to work with. So we're, we're better off than a lot of states. Um, and we have some resources here since we don't have a lot of time today. I just kind of wanted to throw up a couple of different ideas here and then give you some links to potential resources related to all these topics. So um, we've got information, research results and recommendations on custom feeding. What do you look for in a, in a lot if you're sending a cow somewhere else? Um, maybe you think about bale grazing if you can't get the bales hauled in. Maybe you've got some swaths that never got put up. And so we've got information on that um, on the NDSU website. Dry lotting or limit feeding is, is an option if you're short on forages. Um, there's some information out of the University of Nebraska where they have mixed crop residues or low quality forages with a co-product um, kind of in you know, a silage bag or something like that and had really good results um, feeding that to cows. And then of course also consider all the alternatives we have in terms of co-products, we've got you can work a little bit with straw, liquids, all those things. So we've got an alternative feeds publication that might be helpful when you're considering some of those. I think the key thing to keep in mind um, when you're, you know, kind of figuring out what your feeding management needs to be, um, look, for, look for feeds that are local, look for different options. Um, maybe there's a neighbor up the road that couldn't get something harvested and he's willing to graze it and he doesn't have livestock of his own. And so, you might have to step outside of the box a little bit and, and think about something that you haven't done before. When we are feeding forages, it's important to try to limit hay waste. And so things like bale feeders, um, you know, the cone bale feeder can cut hay waste down to a little over 3%. And so sometimes when we're rolling out bales, that wastage might be as high as 30 to 45%. And so you might need to kind of change your feed, feeding strategies a little bit. Um, and maybe not put out more than one day of hay at a time. That's what I mean by reducing access. Um, make sure that we're supplementing correctly. And again, this comes back to that nutrient analysis and making sure, you know, seeing where we're short on nutrients and seeing where we might be adequate um, and then filling in with that correct supplement rather than giving you something you don't need. Really recommend sorting the cattle um, based on body condition score and, and age. Um, that's the most efficient way to feed cattle. Um, some of your cows with the lowest nutrient requirements, so your mature cows um, where the calves are weaned, you can use your lower quality forages with them and then save your higher quality forages for weaned calves, um, pregnant heifers, things like that. Of course, with cold weather coming, you're going to have considerations such as, you know, providing bedding, windbreaks. Um, again, here's a link to a publication that covers some of that information. So just to kind of summarize here, um, I think, you know, we do have a lot of options out there. Um, it's easy to get emotional about the situation. I know a lot of people are feeling a lot of pressure and stress. Um, get somebody to help you through this and talk through it. Of course, we in Extension are always here for you. We'll help you with ration development. We'll help you get your samples um, and help you interpret that analysis. You might need to get a little bit creative. Um, keep an eye on herd condition, and of course, always take care of yourself and your family first. So it's sure an emotional time and we're all feeling for you. So be sure and use us. Thank you, Jana. Our next speaker is gonna be um, Carl Hoppe, the Livestock Systems Specialist at the Carrington Research Extension Center. And he's gonna talk about the calves component of our cow-calf operation and strategies for feeding those calves. Thank you. 
talking about the key measures that that uh a lot of delayed weaning if uh thank you again carl hoppy at the carrington research extension center talking about fall calf feeding strategies uh we've had a difficult fall this year there's been a lot of delayed weaning sometimes people would have most of their calves weaned in october bunk broke and fed and then shipped out and sold this year it appears people haven't even bothered to look at their calves yet since they're too busy looking at harvest and those other issues um, We've had some severe snowstorms, we've had flooding, we've had uh, uh, bales underwater in our part of the world, so consequently it's been rather difficult. So one of our choices now is just leave the calves on the cows for a longer period of time. Of course that comes with issues on uh, having enough feed available for the cow and the calf, and if our pastures are short this time of year, we're gonna see cows losing weight and calves that don't have enough weight to gain or just maintaining their weight this time of the year. So this issue of needing excellent feed or grazing, whether you have a cover crop you can turn into or a pasture that has not been utilized yet, um, that will work quite well for these cows that uh, still have calves on them. Another option is look at creep feed for a calf. Unfortunately, we like to adapt cattle to creep feed and, and doing it at this time of the stay, this time of the year with uh, fully grown calves and uh, lack of feed quality out in the pasture might lead to a real problem on, on having performance without having bloat or acidosis, those issues by feeding creep feed. But that is a possibility and there are some additives that companies have that will limit the intake. And so creep feeding can be an issue here. Be sure to consider the cost per pound of gain though. And uh, then of course, when you're looking at that, you need to consider if, you're, if the creep feed was designed for supplementing grass and adding the extra things that grass doesn't have like protein and, and a little bit of energy, or is it in replacement for grazing, which means it's really utilized as a uh, ration creep feed. Sorry. And uh, then of course, the rate of gain, you could have different goals that you'd like to have, which would be two pounds a day, three pounds a day, or maybe even a better average daily gain. It's up to you to decide where you need to be too. Of course, the next issue we run into is we're gonna sell the calf off the cow right away, or are we gonna do some weaning and then feed them for a little bit longer? Um, it's a catch-22. Uh, neither one is really a good option uh, for right now if you're just sat, I mean, selling off the cow is definitely an option, and feeding and weaning definitely doesn't get them sold right now, but um, if you are going to feed and wean, depends upon what your facilities and equipment are like. A few days ago, our facilities were filled with mud, and now they're frozen over, so perhaps that might work. Um, if you're going to vaccinate, be sure to look at a vaccination protocol and and uh, background these calves for a period of time after weaning so they actually have a chance to build immunity and get over the process of being weaned. Or we can look at extended backgrounding periods here, which uh, can basically mean marketing at a later time after the first year, next March, April, just selling into a different type of time frame. Yeah, that's selling into a different time frame. Um, might really drive the post weaning calf period. In other words, some, right now our calf prices may not be as high as we'd like to see them as in previous years. So we're looking for a better price, thinking maybe after the first of the year, it might be better. I don't know if that's the case, but that certainly is one of the options people look at. We might be selling after the first year just as a tax reason. Sometimes we need our income next year rather than this year. Uh, this year it's kind of unique. If you're selling calves right now, heavier calves aren't discounted as much as we would have anticipated. Um, so that may or may not maintain itself after the first of the year, but it's something that will have a consideration. Corn prices are an issue. Um, we don't know if corn's gonna go up an extra 50 cents or not, but right now we do have some corn available for people to uh, feed our calves. Um, now, where do we feed them? Well, if we're gonna creep feed, we'd definitely feed them out in pasture, or perhaps pull the creep feeder into the pens and feed them with that thing. And of course, the issue is, do we do it with or without cows? Um, that would mean weaning, so we've got an extra step. If we do have uh, the opportunity to feed them at home, we can feed them at the farm or the ranch if the lots are in good shape, um, not muddy, and the manure's already hauled. That definitely is an option that could be done. If the manure's still there and they're filled with mud, of course, things have frozen recently, so that may not be the case um, to allow an opportunity on farm. Or you can check out a custom feed lot. Of course, they're going to charge for feed and yardage. They might also charge on a cost per pound of gain. But uh, be sure to identify their costs and do a budget for backgrounding to see if this is a viable option. But if you don't have, if you need to wean the calves and they're not heavy enough, and you don't have a pen at home to go to, a uh, professional feed lot might be a place to enter those calves. 
Like I said, mud was a problem for the past month. Today it froze overnight, so the lots could be frozen. Um, be sure to remember that vaccines, vaccinations for calves are important, and if they aren't vaccinated, you probably will get discounted at the market. If you're not vaccinated by now, you should at least wean them, vaccinate them, and like, like I said earlier, like the VAC40 program, feed them for at least 45 days to get some weight back on the calves from weaning as well as building the calves. If you're looking at background in calves for a longer period of time, consider uh, what your rate of gain should be. Maybe if it's for heifers, you only want to do one and a quarter, one and three quarters pound a day gain, maybe two. If you're background in calves, you might go between two and three if that steers might be two to three pounds a day average day of the gain the options real over there's a lot of options and how you wish to feed calves and grow them depending upon how long your backgrounding period will be so with that i'd uh, enter any questions later on in the slide series on how to manage calves with that i'll go back to Brian. thank you carl um, so carl touched on this a little bit but our next speaker um, Dr. Jerry Stucka, our extension veterinarian, is going to talk about livestock health considerations. Yeah, thank you, uh, Randa. I hope everyone can hear me here. Is this showing up? Uh, just let me know if this is showing up. Yes? No, not yet. Oh. We just see you. Okay. Okay, hang on. Sorry. Here it comes. Mm -hmm. How about now? Does it show up? Just nod your head so I can see. Yep, okay, very good. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Miranda. And Carl and Jana. As you might expect, we're going to overlap on a lot of things here, but that's okay because it's okay to reiterate some of these points. Um, I'm going to focus mostly on the calf and a lot of the things that Carl talked about, I'll probably talk about as well. I just want to make one point that was we start. You know, this is an unusual year and it calls for unusual management, but that's okay. You know, cattle can be stored. Grain can be stored, but grain doesn't gain in value unless the price goes up. If you manage this properly, if you store calves, whether it's still with the cows or in a pen, and you feed them right, they gain value because they're getting heavier. The grain doesn't get any heavier, but cattle do. So it's a little unusual this year, but it's it, it'll be okay if you can just kind of manage your way through it. I think there's still a lot of opportunities out there to, to manage this thing properly. I just took put this picture in here. These were cattle that just came off grass, you expect them to come into nice conditions and it's still muddy and kind of wet. So that's what we're dealing with. That's the reality. Carl talked here. So I divided this into risk. I talked about risk and health. What are the stressors that are facing these calves as this fall? Well, pen conditions. Carl already talked about pen conditions and, and they're better now with frost. And you can still haul manure if the ground is frozen. Get the manure that's accumulated and you can still move that. It'll move a lot easier now that the uh, temperatures have dropped. So that still can be done, but that, that precludes sometimes weaning into these pens if there's still a lot of manure. Consider feed supplies and the rations, the quality and the delivery, whether you can do this or not, whether there's too mud, too much mud in your facility, you can't even deliver rations. All those things kind of been talked about. I want you to think about weaning procedures because separating calves from cows, no matter how you do it, is a stressful situation calf loses its companion that said for the last five six months and it loses its pacifier loses that ability to nurse that cow so that no matter how you do it it's a stressful thing even vaccination by itself can be stressful if it's done at the wrong time i always prefer that we vaccinate while the calf is still with the cow and then a big one for me is is this consideration because this can be a stressor perhaps even one of the biggest stressors that cattle face because our ranches these days are, are much larger, there's more cattle, we, we pasture cattle during the summer in many different pastures. When you bring all those calves together as a group, now we have commingling stress. So I, I want you to consider that as well. So let's go to the next slide and go away from stress and talk about the options. 
The colder weather will firm pens. You can still move manure when the pen is firm. I said that already. Got to think about bedding. If I'm going to move into this pen, I've got some manure I can move. Now I'm going to wean calves. Make sure you got some bedding on hand, whether it's stover, whether it's straw, some type of bedding to insulate those cattle from that cold ground. And you got to think about not only now, but even later on. And so bedding's a big deal when it comes to weaning calves in this in our part of the world. And this is another one as well. Le and, and Carl said this: leave cows and calves together. Just wean later. There's no uh, tenth commandment that says thou shalt wean calves on October fifteenth. It's it's okay to leave them together it's just the feeding becomes a little bit more aggressive when they're still together at this time of the year but it's okay you can do this and you can vaccinate the calves while they're still with the mother and one of the benefits of, of leaving cows and calves together is that you can feed them together and those calves get used to eating a similar to ration to what they're going to eat when you actually go ahead with the weaning process so it takes part of that weaning stress away if they know how to eat already and their rations familiar to it. And then if you leave cows and calves together, it actually reduces that commingling co stress. The contrast would be putting all those calves in a pen together without their mothers. You commingle stress, you wean stress. If you leave the cows and calves together from all these pastures and you feed them together, you actually reduce that commingling stress a great deal. So those are some of the options as I thought about this whole issue of risk and, and keeping calves healthy at, at this time of the year. And it's, you know, even if we get conditions like this and we're not too far away from there, it's okay to feed calves out on winter feeding grounds. It's okay to feed cows out there. There's, there's no rule that I know of that says you have to wean into a, a pen. The challenge there becomes uh, maintaining at least for the first week or so a separation from cow and calf. So anyway, that's what I had to share with you today and, and thanks for listening in. And uh, it just, just remember that it's unusual, but we can get ourselves through this this year. So thanks. Thank you, Dr. Stucka. Our next speaker is going to be Dr. Yuri Montanholi. He is our new Extension Beef Cattle Specialist based here in Fargo, and he is going to be talking a little bit more about body condition scoring and how we can use that to make decisions. All right. Uh, thanks, Miranda, for the introduction. Uh, it is my, my great pleasure to be presenting my first uh, webinar at, uh, at the NDU, NDSU Extension. And uh, I hope uh, it will be of uh, assistance. Just a little thing here. Uh, sorry, Miranda, do you see my main screen, my presentation screen? Okay. All right. So um, this is a beautiful picture, and I would enjoy more if it wasn't uh, a soybean field uh, floated with water. So this is a year that you're, you're handling a lot of that. And I could witness uh, this farmer here trying to pump water for over two weeks in a row from a field until they simply gave up for doing that. So it was really tough and hard to, to watch that, to witness that. And we see that uh, we still have a lot of crops to be harvested. And when it comes to, to livestock production, uh, I just got this um, uh, article from the James, James Townsend from this weekend, showing that uh, it's been hard to, to, to get our bales and uh, be ready to feed our cattle. So with that, uh, we probably, it might be short of feed, or even feed might be of poor quality. So we need to work on that. Uh, and uh, from an animal science perspective, there are many ways of uh, handling uh, those uh, issues. 
uh, when you look at our toolbox. And one of these uh, techniques would be the manipulation of body condition score. However, uh, before moving into the details on that, I really would like to address some general uh, bar keeping uh, points uh, on this. So basically, you need to look at each farm, at each scenario, and understand like uh, what's the feed resource. So how many bales are stored, uh, how many area uh, the farmer would have for fall grazing or for winter grazing, and also supplementation. And when I say supplementation, it's not even uh, protein and carbohydrates, but it's really the minerals. Because sometimes when we're short of coins, we start cutting uh, corners on that, and then we might have issues, some issues later on. And then uh, the next step on that would be the number of cattle to be fed. And this is important. I think that uh, if there is a good year to be a bit more strict on what is to cool an animal, to remove an animal from the herd, probably this is the good year to be strict on that. And think about the, the older cows that you have, if they're really dropping a heavy calf every year or not. So be a bit um, careful and, and, and mindful when doing that. And same, same thing applies to like uh, replacement animals or even the number of bulls that you might have on farm. Do you need all those bulls or could you do without less one or less two? And then the third part to consider are uh, aspects related to, to management per se. So it is a good year to do investments on wind breaks. Uh, wind breaks are something that you carry on over the years you can be using. Uh, when the animal has a shelter, has some protection, has some good uh, environment, uh, then we'll be uh, losing less heat, so then we'll be preserving more the, the, uh, the reserves. Also, when it looks to uh, bay feeders, are those bay feeders like in a good shape or do need some renovation, some work on them? So consider that too. And as Jenna mentioned, uh, splitting the herd can be a good idea. So splitting the herd according body condition score, uh, and also according to the to the age of the animals, uh, that could be quite helpful. So uh, talk about body condition score now. So uh, there is a few ways of grading the animals. Uh, in US, you use the grade one to nine, and it's basically it is an uh, indication of fatness. Uh, you look to those body locations uh, found uh, indicated here in this slide, and then you see how fat the animals are uh, with a scale. And to illustrate this, I will show you. Uh, what uh, Mickey Mouse was doing in 1928 uh, for body condition score. Take a look on this. So yes, uh, we can manipulate body condition score by feeding the animal. And this is the, the best presentation, uh, best pictures that I found on the internet about that, showing the nine grades, so one to nine uh, for body condition, with one being the leanest guy animals and the number nine being the one with um, uh, more fat. And most of the times when I'm managing a herd it would be between uh, five and six and seven, that's pretty much it. And you'll be talking about that according to the, to the stage that the animal are. So uh, basically, uh, there is a period uh, on the, the yearly cycle of a cow that's very critical. It overlaps uh, the last third of the gestation and uh, the first uh, three months of lactation. So in this area, in this shaded area here, it, that's where, where the cow will need more uh, resources uh, to, to deal with uh, fetal growth, and then uh, uh, producing milk for junior. So this is quite important, uh, there is that uh, you need to feed the cows very well. If you're short of feed there, the animals will be losing condition and you need to deal with that. Also in tough years, uh, you might be considering uh, quit feeding your, your cows at an early stage of life, so then you can offset some of the, 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 the burnout on the cow. 
So this is pretty much Mother Nature. And then you see how that works uh, with the calendar year that we have. So imagine it, an entire year. That's the situation uh, here in this graph. And then with uh, animals calving, the peak of calving a farm on February 1st. So let's say the early spring calves. So if you translate that same graph from before, uh, the critical period would be from November, uh, from beginning of November until end of April. So that's quite quite a stretch, and we need to try to, to work on, with our animals so they would uh, have a good condition score to calve and then to rebred, right? Because you, you do need them to get pregnant again quite soon. And this would be the period that you, you probably you would, would be a bit more cons conservative when it comes to body condition score. And uh, if you're not in that uh, shape that you can be so cons conservative for such a long period, I would say that uh, the 30 days around the calving, that's probably where we could be doing some extra work to try to keep our cows uh, in good shape. It's important that uh, if you are to increase the um, the body condition of the cows, you're right in the time for doing that because uh, once they drop the calves, most of the energy that you'll be feeding to the cow will be end up converting to milk. So very little goes to, to recovering body condition. So that's quite important. And also for animals that are up to four years old, like the period that the cows are still growing, it's important that you consider uh, these uh, suggestions of uh, uh, body condition uh, one, one degree higher. So we talk about six, seven, and five. Uh, because those animals also they have uh, a greater demand uh, than, than, than mature cows. And for those of you that have different uh, peaks or different uh, seasons for, for calving, then you can just uh, move this bar around and see what you, what you can see the periods of higher demand of the cows. So that's pretty much a, a general uh, idea about this. Of course, it, that this would vary from, from, from farm to farm. And I uh, really I encourage you to work on this because this is management and most of the times management doesn't cost much money. It's more like planning uh, 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 according to the situation. So consider that uh, you're more than welcome to seek for the assistance for your uh, county agent. And also if you have uh, other cow issues or nice things to share about cows, you're more than welcome to contact me. And if you can help, we are here to help you. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Yuri. Um, so our next speaker is going to be Lisa Peterson, and she is going to talk about and give some guidance on making some calling decisions during this time. Miranda, somebody's still sharing, so I can't share. Okay, sorry. Just trying to be ahead of the game. Okay, so can you all see that? Hello? Friends? Yes. Yep, it looks good. Okay, all right, sounds good. So uh, I'm going to talk about strategic culling of beef cattle herds. As my uh, husband said yesterday, I'm the hit man here. So um, We'll see what we can do to maybe minimize the amount of animals we have in the herd, especially if, if we're in a short feed, uh, feed or resource situation. So I think before we start culling, we need to determine what our culling criteria is. And with every operation I have ever dealt with, that is going to be different. It's different from the, the ranch that my husband and I run with his family than it is my dad's operation in Southwest Colorado. And so before calling above the obvious, uh, the beyond the obvious, things like open cows, set goals for your operation. And I think that that'll make your calling decisions much easier. Use records to help you make the decision. You can see here that this producer's calving book, they have some notations over here on the right side. The GFGU is a feet and utter score, so good feet, good utter, uh, to help them make calling decisions. And if you're not keeping some type of production records, now is a really good time to start. So some reasons to call beyond the three O's, and I call the three O's open, ornery, and old, are a shortage of feed, economics, and then traits beyond convenience. So. I'm just gonna lay this out here. This is probably a more of a long-term situation rather than a short-term one. 
on uh, some reasons to cull beyond the three O's. And that is that a disciplined culling program can return more potential value for heifer calves. And we've seen this fall a tremendous discount for heifer calves. And however, not in all herds, and um, there were some cattle that sold yesterday that I watched that did not have a huge discount for heifer calves. And so I looked at a, a couple herds in October of 2016 and uh, just evaluated them. They were the uh, same weight, same breed, um, sold on the same day. And in herd one, the heifers uh, brought $120 more than the heifers from herd two. And in fact, the herd, herd one heifers actually outsold the steers. So why was that? Well, that herd actually had a very disciplined culling program that they had implemented about 15 years earlier in an effort to add value to their cows. And so that has led them to have a lower culling rate and the ability to retain more cows and sell more replacement heifers. Uh, the replacement rates of herd one is about 8% and herd two is about 21%. And it, they have used that as a long-term strategy to improve profitability in their operation. However, today, I think we need to look at um, some short-term goals for culling. And I would say start with the easiest decision first, which is to get rid of open cows. If you're not an operation that preg checks on a regular basis, this is the year that you need to do that. Don't skip preg checking. And uh, that is going to be your easy decision to get rid of those open cows. You don't want to be feeding any more mouths than you have to, especially if they're not going to return something in, uh, next year. And so after culling your opens, the decisions tend to get more challenging for most operations. Um, the first thing I would do after that is get rid of the bad actors. And those are your ornery cows, bad dispositions, cows that don't like to stay in, all of those cows. So uh, disposition issues are a human safety issue. They're typically heritable. We know that they decrease profitability at the cow-calf level, they decrease profitability at the feed yard level, and they also impact, impact carcass quality and livestock safety. And This is one of my favorite photos. It's been around the internet several times. Uh, somebody was selling a black cow that was the third calver. She was bred to an Angus bull who was turned out on June 20th. They knew a lot about this cow. And here down here at the bottom it says, wife is scared of cow, husband is scared of wife, cow has to go. Well, that's a good reason to send your cows to town that have uh, bad dispositions. Next, I think it's easy for us to look at feet and legs and the structure of our feet and legs. Most of that structure starts in the shoulder area. Um, when we look at bad feet and I get lots of calls about the causes of cracks in feet, and long toes and all those kind of things, there's typically a genetic component that is not only related to structure, but also related to vertical cracks like you can see in uh, this left-hand picture, uh, corkscrew claws are highly heritable, and then long toes. Uh, bad feet affect productivity and profitability. There are well-being issues. They cause issues in the feed yard, oftentimes issues on trucks. And so uh, if I'm looking at trying to get rid of some cows, um, I would look at the feet and legs. Next are udder quality. There's been some discussion about whether poorly uh, structured udders are less profitable or if the calves from those cows are less profitable. Um, these things are often genetic. I consider them um, what I would call a um, convenience trait. Nobody likes messing with a cow and having to get a calf to suck. However, we know that colostrum is equal to calf health and profitability. And so if that calf can't get to suck because those uh, teats are too large or, or the cow has a pendulous udder, um, that can be a serious issue, and if udders drag, we end up with increased incidence of diseases like scours. No doubt there's a, a lot more labor and management with cows with poor udders, and in my opinion, time is equal to money, and you never have to deal with these cows when it's sunny and 60 and you have a lot of time on your hands. It seems like we have to deal with them when we want to get uh, to the, the kids' basketball games. Late breads uh, can be an easy place to cull. Uh, depending on your calving season and how long your cows were exposed to bulls. So if you have a short calving season, short days of exposure, say um, uh, two cycles, 45 days or so, you're probably not going to be able to sort out those late breads as easily as somebody who doesn't pull the bulls. And so 
We know that calves born in the first, first 21 days are more profitable off the cow, they're more profitable in the feed yard and in the packing plant on the rail. They offer more weaning weight and uh, long term, the replacement heifers um, that are born in those first 21 days are more, produ more productive and have more longevity in the herd. And your calf, cows that calve in the first 20, 21 days um, have a higher percentage who cycle back quicker and breed back quicker. And if we have another wet spring, one thing for us to consider is, do you want to be dealing with planting and calving at the same time if your late calvers land you in that late April, uh, May timeframe? Yuri talked really, gave a nice presentation on body condition score. Jana talked a lot about sorting cows. I think looking at your cows, and if you have some extremely thin cows, um, they would be a target for me to get rid of. And in many cases, we're looking at a shortage of feed. Um, they're going to be an increased level of management. Um, they're going to probably have calves that, that provide you some challenges if we can't get, increase their body condition score. So I would look at those cows that are in those body condition scores, twos and threes, uh, to make a new career. I happen to be a fan of old cows. I have a soft spot in my heart for old cows. Um, they're the cows that are profitable in our herds. They've stuck around for a long time, typically under uh, stronger culling regiments. And so you can look at your old cows, check their mouths, uh, um, score their teeth, whether they have a full mouth of teeth or whether they only have stumps like the mouth on this cow on the right hand side. Uh, but sure, make sure that they are still sound, their feet and legs are still good, they still have decent body condition, um, they still have a good udder underneath them, and they are still able to produce at a similar uh, level to their younger herd mates. I am not a fan of keeping an old cow around just because I like her um, in an effort uh, and then, um, I guess, sacrifice some production out of her. Uh, generally, a cow has to be seven or eight years old before she becomes income and instead of expense. And so I would not just automatically cull based upon old cows, but if you have some old cows that are thin and, and going down in their production, I would consider culling them. Poor producers are an easy target for me. You need to use records to determine that. And I say, unless a cow has a good reason that she hasn't raised a decent calf this year, you know, maybe that calf broke a leg or something. But if she has a habitual record of raising a dink, I would say let her go to work for somebody else. In our herds today, everyone needs to earn their keep. And then finally, and Yuri brought this up, don't forget the bull. Apply similar culling criteria to your bull battery. So if you have some bulls that got hurt, they have hurt penises, uh, maybe they were have some um, fertility issues, disposition issues, feet and leg issues, I would consider culling them now. You don't want to feed those guys through the winter, uh, especially if you're short on feed resources and you sure don't want to let them freeload. And then finally, I would say we need to consider stopping the truck and making sure that we check all treatment records, make sure that those animals haven't, for example, been poured with um, some type of anti-parasitic and not met their withdrawal time. Are all cattle in a body condition score greater than two and can they stand and walk on all four legs? Ask yourself, are all the animals healthy? And my favorite question, I think the most important on here is, would you feed your family what you just loaded? And if that answer is no, I would unload them. So uh, we wish you the best. If you need anything, please let us know. Many of us are living this challenge with you, um, and we're here to talk and listen and help you through your challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And Lisa did a great lead in for our next speaker. Um, Brian Parman, who is our Extension Egg Finance Specialist, he is also joining us from the road as he is traveling with the rest of our Extension Egg Economics and as they're doing their Egg Lender Series this week. So I want to thank Brian for taking the time to join us from the road as well as Carl and Jana. Yeah, and I've got, uh, I've got Tim Petrie here with me. Can you hear me all right? Yes. I know it looks like we're angelic, but that's the lighting behind our heads. So anyway, we're gonna talk a little bit about markets and, and just some options that uh, producers have to use. And I know Tim had some thoughts, so I'm gonna start off and have him lead off. Well, yeah, the, you know, with this weather and uh, we've already put out a news release, but 
it's very, very important that uh, producers provide all the information they can to their market because we're in the information age now and that's what creates value. So certainly, you know, when shots were given and even where they're given and so on, but even be genetics, anything related to information that might cause value to calves is very, very important because uh, any calves that are a little bit off from the average or something are receiving huge discounts. That's uh, always a case this time of the year when we have big runs of livestock, buyers can be more selective. So certainly do that. And, you know, just looking at the market, people are wondering why are the heavyweight seven, 800 pounders selling for almost the same as calves right now. And it's a supply and demand thing. Um, not a lot of the heavyweights sold now like they were a month or two ago. And then we're just bombarded with calves. And again, uh, unweaned calves, uh, balling calves are going to be uh, discounted uh, at the market. But uh, I would suggest producers talk to their market in advance, weeks if they can, and, and, and get tips uh, from them. Uh, another reason why the heavier weights are selling so well is if you look at the futures today, April live cattle futures are 124 and uh, by June they're down to 113, so a big discount there. So any of the cattle that can get to market for that uh, April market are just selling a lot better than, and uh, you know, than the ones uh, with the June futures or by August it's even lower, about 111. So. Yeah, absolutely. The feed tops right now, and folks are worried about what corn prices are going to do. So they're willing to pay for you to put weight on them if you can possibly do it. And that's that thing with those heavyweight calves. We we briefly touched on if you're going to do that, you could have an option to utilize the LRP program for backgrounding into the into the spring and locking in a price as an option that somebody could take. And for the most part, that's really the only options we have. I don't know if uh, it, it should be touched on real quick. Again, said though, if you have those frozen eared and frozen tailed calves, it's been shown that if you can get them up to seven or 800 pounds, the discount that you're gonna take is not gonna be nearly as large as it would have been if you show up there at five, six, 600 weight with frozen off ears and tails. There's plenty of debate on if that should or shouldn't be so, but the fact is that's what the market pays. But if you can get them heavier, that signifies to the market that, hey, there's nothing wrong with this animal other than missing the ears and tails, and therefore the discount shift isn't as high. And that's pretty much all we have to say on that matter uh, as of now. So with that, we'll turn it back over. Thank you, Brian and Tim, for joining us from the road. We, re we appreciate that. Thank so you. that is the end of our webinar. We're going to open it up for questions. Before we do, I want to let everybody know that we do have a short survey. Um, so if you could please provide some feedback about today's webinar and provide um, some input on future topics that you would like us to, to share with you. We are recording all the webinars. So if you can't make this, make another one, you can find those on our website. So if you go to NDSU Extension Livestock Management Team and scroll to the bottom, there is a topic tab that links to all the, a page with all of the webinars. And then also if you wanna follow up with any of the specialists that talked today, if you go to the contact connect page, you can find the contact information for all of today's speakers. With that, I will open it up for questions. Brian and Tim, I have a question about um, our market cow and bull markets right now. Is there some value to adding some weight and condition to cows or would it be preferred just to send them down the road even if guys have some supplemental feed that they could put into them? Yeah, sure. If you've got to feed, you know, cow prices and, and bulls too are at the low now because of the PG checking is going on, they're all coming to market. so always the low for the market around here. So if you've got feed, which a lot of people don't, and then the cows have to go to town, uh, keeping them putting some weight on them and waiting so the big runs are over here in a month or two, uh, usually does pay dividends. 
Yeah, but the, the key point is you, you have the fee. Joshua, you raised your hand. Do you have a question? Yeah, so I was wondering what's the best way to feed because all like I was feeding during that snowstorm and noticing that we had lots of mold in our, our hay. What is the best way to feed? Is the best way to go through a bale processor or do we get uh have a hay grinder come in, grind that stuff up, try to try to knock some of that mold out of there? Or... Jana, Carl, I'm gonna hand that one over to you. And start video. Oh, gonna have to. Are we still there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi. Yes. Uh, Carl Hoppy, um, trying to reduce the extra noise in the room here. Mold is a tough question there. Um, too much mold indicates poor quality feed, decreased in feed value, and if they inhale too much, you could end up with some respiratory problems. Mold in itself isn't necessarily a bad deal, and then it's indicative of poor feed quality. But there's a limit to how much mold you can have um, in a cow ration. You might upset the rumen environment. You might end up uh, causing some other uh, uh, systemic problems. If she's pregnant, perhaps a mycotic uh, infection leads to a mycotic abortion. So those types of things. Um, you know, when you're stuck between a rock and a hard spot, what do you do? You end up feeding something, but if your cows get sick from feeding the mold, definitely stop doing that. That's what I'd call a biological assay. Um, in general, yeah, I suppose you could test for mold counts and see just how moldy it is, although it's obvious it's moldy if you dump it on the ground like that. Refraining from feeding it would be a good thing. There might be some other things you can add to the ration to uh, extend it out or maybe only have just a small part of the ration be the moldy feed, but um, always be wary of moldy feed, especially if it's moldy sweet clover. Then you'll end up with sweet clover poisoning, and that will be a disastrous episode for you. So. Um, Try to find good feed, and if it's super moldy, pick and choose wisely. Maybe let cows graze more than they need to provide more than what the cows need, thinking that they might select only the good hay and not eat the super moldy hay. Carl, let me jump in here just a little bit as well. He asked about what what I would, if I had moldy hay, I would use a bale processor. You're going to release more spores. There's less chance of cows picking up more of those spores in a from a, a processed bale than if you just set it out for them to eat. So that would be my preference. And and mold causing problems in cows, it, it, that's almost unpredictable. We know, like Carl says, it can cause abortions with mycotic abortions, although it's, it's almost impossible to follow that trail as well. So if they eat it, that's that's probably okay, but I would definitely process it. And if it's real bad, just like Carl says, probably just don't use it at all or maybe put it out for bedding. I mean, it, it right. just, uh, so, and I know it's gonna be more of that this year. That's gonna be the, probably the norm rather than the, uh, the unusual bale. So, yeah. We have any other questions out there? Ryan and Tim had to leave and get on the road again. So if you do have any follow-up for question, questions for them, please email them. Okay. Well, seeing that the line is silent, we'll wrap things up. Again, the these are all recorded. And so you can go to our website to view these later if you need a refresher or to view one of the sessions that maybe you aren't able to join because you are busy trying to get things out of the field and in the lot and managing your operation. If you have any, any further ideas for topics, please fill out that survey and give us your feedback. We really appreciate that. So we can know best how to help you guys out there address the issues you are having. With that, thank you for joining us and we look forward to having you join us for in the future.